After comments made by the U.S. presidential candidate, Donald Trump, some Europeans are considering the possibility of acquiring nuclear weapons. They should think again. On February 10, former United States President Donald Trump recounted a conversation with an unnamed European counterpart in which he stated that he would not protect them from a possible Russian attack because they failed to allocate 2% of their gross domestic product to defense and thus fell short of North Atlantic Treaty Organization NATO, spending targets. Such delinquency would lead Trump to encourage Russia to do whatever the hell they want, given Trump is the probable Republican candidate at the election in November. And currently polling ahead of incumbent President Joe Biden, these comments have triggered concern among European leaders, including German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock, Polish Defense Minister Władysław kosiniak kamysz as well as NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. These concerns were exacerbated on February 9, when Danish Defense Minister Troels Lund Poulsen warned that Russia might militarily challenge NATO's mutual defense article within the next three to five years, considering new knowledge. Some are now calling for the expedited integration of European defense capabilities to the point of acquiring nuclear weapons. This conversation was initiated by European Union EU, Parliamentary Vice President Katerina Barley who perceives a joint nuclear deterrent as part of Europe's path toward to an eventual joint EU army. One suggestion might propose that the two existing European nuclear powers, namely the United Kingdom and France, could increase their stockpiles and integrate them into a joint framework. However, this is also unrealistic as the cost of these two powers expanding their stockpile would be exorbitant. For instance, Britain is already projected to spend 34% of its military budget on maintaining its existing nuclear arsenal. Moreover, it is unlikely that the UK would participate in an EU nuclear weapons program post-Brexit. A fruitful caveat of these debates has been the suggestion to integrate European arms procurement. As the second anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine passes, Armin Papperger, the chief executive of Rainmetal, one of Europe's biggest defense contractors, warned that the continent requires at least a decade to be able to defend itself from a sophisticated aggressor. Presently, European governments procure arms individually through their respective national bureaucracies. A more efficient mechanism would be an integrated, EU-wide procurement processes, for instance through the permanent structured cooperation. Ultimately, such procurement integration could pave the way for a joint European defense force. U.S. presidents have rightfully criticized Europe for not abiding by the 2% rule, as President Barack Obama did. However, European states have drastically improved in this regard. While only four NATO states met the 2% target in 2017, today 11 do, and another 18 members are inching closer to it. Next month, EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen plans to present a new European defense industrial strategy that aims to increase defense spending, improve interoperability, and establish joint procurement of conventional arms. This shows that Europe can adapt when the political will to do so exists. Ultimately, Trump's comments and the prospect of his return to the presidency have triggered an overdue conversation in Europe. While a possible second Trump administration would be comparatively short-lived, Europe must consider how it plans to defend itself without the American nuclear umbrella. On the road toward greater integration, collective defense will be of paramount importance. However, European states, largely embodied by the EU, should shy away from a precarious nuclear option. Rather, its resources should focus on the procurement of conventional arms and ammunition, and not on expensive Cold War era weaponry. Jasper Hofschmidt Morse is a fourth year student of International Security Studies at the Australian National University in Canberra, majoring in Middle East and Central Asian Studies. He previously lived and worked in Germany, where he received the Abiter Diploma. This article is published under a Creative Commons license and may be republished with attribution.